Hello and welcome to this worship service. My name is Carmen Little and I am a lay leader with the Chetwin Shared Ministry. It is my pleasure to be able to worship with you today. Our call to worship. It is by God's grace that we gather for worship. In the midst of our failures, we stand in God's grace. In the midst of our struggles, we boast in our hope through Christ. In the midst of our suffering, we claim the endurance given by the Holy Spirit in every part of our lives. The love of our divine Creator has been poured into our hearts, and it is by God's grace that our lives are changed. We are counting on the active and amazing grace of God today. Help us by our actions to be faithful followers of Jesus. Let us be open to this love as we join together in worship. For this, we give thanks and praise. Our opening prayer. We know that your grace is sufficient and that you are ever-present help in time of need. But sometimes our actions do not reflect these truths. It's much easier for us to either complain about our stressful and difficult circumstances or try to take matters into our own hands to try to fix or change what seems to be causing us to feel so overwhelmed. But we know that we need to come to you and ask for grace when we have reached our limit. You are faithful to provide all things that we need because you are a gracious Father who cares deeply for your children. We come to you as your children today, boldly and humbly asking for your sustaining and powerful grace to carry us through each challenging moment. You are faithful in every season, and we thank you for reminding us to come to you first and foremost and pray without ceasing. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture for today, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Have you ever noticed that there are several Christian cliches used by people such as everything happens for a reason and God helps those who help themselves? Are these really beneficial statements or do they convey an understanding of God's character that may not be helpful for the person to whom we're saying it. An important note to make here is that none of these sayings are in the Bible, even though the Bible is often invoked when they're said as if it makes the statement true. It's hard to argue with someone who starts a sentence with, well, you know, the Bible says. Today, we are looking at the saying, there but for the grace of God go I. It sounds biblical but it's also not in the Bible. The popular legend is that this statement originated in the 16th century. An Englishman by the name of John Bradford was a strong voice in the Protestant Revolution in England, and he found himself on the wrong side of the argument with Queen Mary I. And you didn't want to get on the wrong side of Queen Mary. Bradford was imprisoned in the Tower of London. As he watched some of his compatriots being marched toward the gallows, he's quoted as saying, There, but for the grace of God, goes John Bradford. Unfortunately, Bradford's concept of God's grace must have had an expiration date because soon after, he was burned at the stake. The phrase was later popularized by Winston Churchill, who said it in relation to Sir Strafford Cripps, a pompous and egocentric contemporary. Churchill said of scripts, there, but for the grace of God, goes God. A con commentary on Cripp's sense of self-importance. So we have two historical uses of this phrase, both in very different contexts and with very different meanings. So when we say, there, but for the grace of God, go I, what do we mean? <laughs> 
the majority of people who are asked, what does this mean, will likely say something like, I think it means, gosh, I'm lucky, I'm not like that person. Exactly. That's often the meaning behind the phrase. In actuality, the phrase is meant to be a way of expressing humble gratitude to God for the way in which God's grace has been at work in our lives. It's a way of recognizing that we're not where we are because of our own wisdom or excellence or righteousness, but because of God's grace. But often, the phrase is used as much as a judgmental comment about the other person as it is a testimony to God's grace. A good example of our, is our scripture for today. Two men go into the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, a prominent religious leader in the community. While in the temple, he prays a prayer of thanksgiving to God that he is not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or tax collectors. You can almost see him looking down his nose at the tax collector and saying, there, but for the grace of God and my own general awesomeness, go I. The tax collector, a profession that symbolized the lowest of the low in Jewish society, worked for the Roman government, collecting taxes from their fellow Jews to give to their Roman oppressors. Tax collectors and sinners are often lumped together in scripture to signify the worst people in society, which is exactly where Jesus spent most of his time. What this story highlights for us in regards to our statement today is the judgment that can be inherent in it. At its purest, the cliché is not really about the other person, but it is about how God has been active in the speaker's life to keep them from harm and self-destruction. But this statement is rarely said with the purest of intentions. Instead, it is often said in a way that carries with it an odor of judgment about the person to whom the speaker is being compared. That's because the cliché is often said in a vertical direction, spoken from up top about someone down below. To highlight the superficiality of this discrepancy, I saw a cartoon once of a homeless man sitting on a curb asking for donations. Across the street, a limo pulls up and a wealthy man steps out, cell phone attached to his ear, trailed by a team of personal assistants rushing him off to his next appointment. The rich man looks discombobulated as he hurries to the office building. The homeless man looks at his friend and says, there, but for the grace of God, go I. It's funny, because that's not how it's supposed to happen. The rich man is supposed to look down on the beggar, not the other way around. What this cliché does is create a sense of social and spiritual stratification between the speaker and the object of comparison. The fact that there's an object of comparison in the first place should raise a red flag for us about the effectiveness of this statement. True faith never expresses itself over and against someone else. Just like in the cliché, God helps those who help themselves, the speaker is often someone who's made it in life, and they're speaking about someone less fortunate or less motivated than them. What this statement does is create a spiritual buffer zone between me the recipient of God's grace, and that other person. But here's the thing. To say, there but for the grace of God go I, implies that the other person isn't covered by God's grace, that they have somehow fallen outside of the parameter of God's reach. It conveys the message that the other person, the drug addict, the homeless person, the tax collector, isn't worthy of receiving God's grace because of the condition that they're in. Or, the statement implies that the other person has been offered God's grace but refused it, thus landing them in their current predicament, while you, the much wiser and more faithful person, did indeed accept the offer, which is why you are up here and they are down there. So either God doesn't love them enough to offer them grace, or they don't love God enough to accept it. Either way, thank God we're not like them. But we are, aren't we? The Pharisee tried to offer evidence of how pious he was, unlike the rogues and adulterers around him. But God doesn't prorate sins, and the Pharisee was just as much in need of God's grace as the tax collector. 
Oftentimes, the only difference between those of us up here and the folks down there is that the consequences of their sins are more visible. You can hide things like pride and greed and prejudice really well to the point that you think you no longer need God's grace because you've made it. You're in the spiritual clear. But God's grace is not a flu shot, a one and done inoculation against sin. It's an immunization we have to take daily because every day we're susceptible to being infected by the temptations that separate us from God and from each other. That separation is what is at the heart of this cliché and what we must fight against when we feel tempted to say it. Remember when I said earlier that it's important to note that Jesus spent his time with tax collectors and sinners? Those are often the very people to whom we compare ourselves when using this cliché. Jesus was the embodiment of the grace of God, a living, breathing grace dispenser taking God's love and mercy into those places that most of us are afraid to go. So if Jesus is with them, then God's grace is there as well. There are no limits to the places God's grace will go and the people with whom God's grace rests. We may like to think that there is. It's a lot easier for us to worship a God who dislikes all the same people we do. But in God's eyes, there is no comparison. Each of us is a child of God, and regardless of our circumstances and our choices and our sins, God loves us. We are all the recipients of God's grace. If we take that to heart, it changes how we respond to those we see as below us. Rather than creating a buffer zone by distancing ourselves from them, we are called to close the gap by reaching out, becoming an extension of God's grace to those who need to be reminded that God still loves them, even if they feel no one else does. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are commissioned to be dispensers of grace in this world, going to the tax collectors and sinners and strangers and forgotten and saying, you and me, we're a lot alike. God loves both of us. God's grace is for both of us. Instead of saying, there, but for the grace of God go I, maybe we should ask ourselves, how can I be a grace dispenser to this other person less fortunate than me? No comparison there. That's not praying, God, thank you that I'm not like other people. That's praying, God, thank you that I am like other people even those different from me. Comparison may be human nature as a measurement of our progress, but that gets us in trouble when it comes to our faith journey, leading us to say things like, we can use it, pardon me, leading us to say things like, there but for the grace of God go I. So maybe the best comparison as we move forward in faith, running our own race one halting step at a time, lifting ourselves up by putting someone else down, even unintentionally, may actually be more of a hurdle than a help. Instead of comparing ourselves to someone else, we are best served by reciting the old slave prayer used by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the end of his sermons. Oh God, I ain't what I ought to be, and I ain't what I'm going to be, but by your grace, I ain't what I used to be or remembering these words from the hymn, Amazing Grace. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. So thanks be to the grace of God. And now, May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.